It is the 28th of March, 1942. High in the skies over the ancient Hanseatic port of Lübeck, hundreds of RAF bombers drone in. It is the first night of the Allies' new area bombing campaign, one designed to dehouse the workers of Nazi Germany by causing firestorms in all of their major cities. The logic is simple. If they're homeless, they're powerless. And in one version of history, the real one, it is the first time the Allies level most of a city in one night. They'll go on to do it again, and again, and again. But tonight, in some parallel universe, the anti-aircraft guns don't go off. There are no air raid sirens in the city. It is peaceful, but the bombers are still coming. And from the silent city, where the people sleep soundly in their beds, an unholy noise erupts into the sky, and within seconds, the RAF bombers are catching fire, yawing downwards into the fields, pitching out into the Baltic Sea. The noise erupts again and takes the rest in the rear of the formation. The city goes back to sleep, safe for another night. After all, if you have a death ray, why would you not sleep soundly in your bed? This is Scotland, a podcast about history and where we made it. I'm Michael Park. Suppose that you had eight pints of water 3,000 feet above the ground, and suppose that water was at 98 degrees Fahrenheit and you wanted to heat it to 105 degrees. How much radio frequency power would you require from a distance of three miles? That's the mathematical question being posed by Robert Watson Watt to his colleagues. 100 degrees Fahrenheit is just the right temperature to kill or incapacitate an adult man. That adult man might be a pilot. It is 1935. Nazi Germany don't have a death ray. But there's one big old rumour down the rounds that they do. Rumours have been current recently in this country and reports have come from many parts of the world as if to corroborate these rumours in some measure of the invention of mysterious rays possessing revolutionary powers. For they are said to be able to kill at a distance and to put machinery out of action as soon as it comes within range. The warfare of the future has been visualised as one where so-called death rays will play upon an advancing army, rendering its members unconscious or killing them by the hundred thousand, working far more terrible destruction than hosts of machine gun or heavy artillery, while warships and tanks will be rendered helpless and aircraft will crash to their feet. Indeed, the death toll will be so terrible that many declare warfare will be rendered impossible. Edmund Roberts, The Herne Bay Press, Saturday the 28th of September, 1935. And so the Committee for the Scientific Survey of Air Defence, CSAD, for the purposes of this story, had set about trying to make their own, and quickly realised that it wasn't going to be possible. 1930s Mythbusters. You didn't really think this was going to be a story about an actual death ray, did you? Robert Watson Watt was a bit of a radio pioneer. He had gone from University College Dundee straight to the Met Office, where he had used his granular knowledge of physics to detect lightning storms. Now, this isn't a science podcast and I'm in no way qualified to explain how this works. Much the same as my history qualifications, I guess. But basically, lightning gives off a radio signal when it ionises the air around it. Once it does that... An operator can use an antenna to listen for other lightning strikes and create a general impression of where a storm is, where it's going. And this was handy for pilots since, again, I'm no aviator, but flying into a lightning storm has the potential to ruin your day, and your life, to be perfectly honest. That brings us back to 1935 and the impossible death ray designed to kill pilots and send planes crashing into the ground. Heavy bombers have reached the point where they can approach at such a high altitude that conventional anti-aircraft guns are useless, allowing them to flatten countries indiscriminately. With the death ray an impossibility, Watt's assistant, Skip Wilkins, puts two and two together 
and makes an incredibly complicated equation. While lightning creates a radio signal in the air, aircraft are known to disrupt shortwave radio communications when they're in flight. So Watt and Wilkins set to work coming up with a concept where radio signals can be fired at aircraft, not unlike a death ray, in order to return a reflection from the flying object, and therefore pinpoint its location on a display, which to be fair isn't very like a death ray at all. On 26th of February, the first trial of radio detection and ranging, radar, is made with only Watt, Wilkins, and CSAD board member AP Rowe in attendance, as a bemused bomber pilot is made to fly around Daventry for hours. The second tests, which were scaled up to allow a fighter to intercept a bomber were a disaster, and usually led to the fighter flying past the bomber before it even knew it was there. The solution to that was a massive command and control structure, with locations plotted on those giant map tables that you'll have seen in the movies. It was called the Dowding System, after Hugh Dowding, but that's for another episode. Germany didn't know what to make of these sites, which sprang up in the south of England, a series of towering masts and interconnected lines known as Chain Home. Or did they? You see, you might think that giant masts pointing out to sea might be obvious indicators of radar, but the Germans didn't since the antennae weren't in any way suited to the kinds of frequencies that radar used, so they assumed that the British didn't have it. It's a long-standing myth that Scottish scientist Robert Watson Watt and his team invented radar, won the Battle of Britain, stopped the Blitz and sent us all off to a bally top hole time in the blighty sun. But radar was first posited by a German, Heinrich Hertz. Even Nikola Tesla experimented with it. When we raise the voice and hear an echo in reply, we know that the sound of the voice must have reached a distant wall or boundary, and must have been reflected from the same. Exactly as the sound, so an electrical wave is reflected, and the same evidence can be used to determine the relative position or course of a moving object, such as a vessel at sea. What I'm saying is that basically everyone with a name in radio was aware of the concept of radio positioning. Hulsmeyer, Telefunken, that's the real name, stop laughing. Even Marconi. And then there was Dr. Rudolf Kuhnold. He rediscovered Hulsmeyer's work in 1933. And by 1938, the Germans had a radar system all of their own. It was called Freya, and it didn't work like the British system. In fact, the radar that we know today with the spinning dish on top of a tower owes more to Freya than it does to Watson Watt. You could say that the Germans invented radar, not Robert Watson Watt, our physicist hero from Brecon. But, along with his team, he did nail it. While the Germans were never really sure how best to put their Freya system into practice, Watson Watt had, by his own admission, created a radar system with more failings than a pandemic government, but he bought into that old proverb. Give them the third best to go on with. The second best comes too late, and the best never comes. In other words, perfect is the enemy of good. The system employed by the British may have been jankier than those employed in the United States and Germany. After all, it only operated out over water and was pretty useless across land. But all they needed to monitor was the airspace over the English Channel. The people operating it knew exactly what they were doing, and thanks to the Dowding system, they were able to implement it in a way that mitigated the drawbacks of this third best technology. And then came the kicker. It is September 1940, and aboard the liner the Duchess of Richmond, a large deed box lies under the bed of a delegate on his way to Washington. Contained inside is a piece of technology that has the potential to swing the war. The item is so important that the box has a series of holes drilled in it to ensure that, if the Duchess of Richmond comes under U-boat attack, the box will sink to the ocean floor along with her. It doesn't contain a weapon, but a resonant capacity magnetron. Invented by Watson Watt and his team, the magnetron might not sound like much, it might even sound boring, 
but this little device would allow radar units to be made small enough to be installed in fighter aircraft and bombers. In other words, it would let them see their targets at night. And if the Americans, still refusing to take part in the Second World War, produced them for the bomb-battered British, they might just win the thing. By the end of 1945, the Bell Telephone Company had produced more than a million magnetrons, and Watson Watt and his team from the Air Ministry had all but perfected an imperfect system and shortened the war. After moving to Canada in the 1950s, Watson Watt discovered the true power of radar, though. He was pulled over for speeding by a police officer using an early radar gun. I don't know what you were going to do with it. I would never have invented it. You've been listening to Scotland. It was written and produced by me, Michael Park, and is a production of Be Quiet Media. Additional voices in this episode were by David Allen and Stevie Whiteford. The music for every episode of Scotland is by our very own Beep 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 Mitch Bain. You can check out more of his work at mitchbain.bequiet.media You can find out more about the show and read transcripts on our website scotlandpodcast.net and we're on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram too. Find us by searching Scotland a Scottish history podcast. Thanks for listening. Look after each other. We'll see you next time.